Dia de los Muertos for me is something that is very much LA. It was revived by the artist community in the early 70s in Los Angeles through self-help graphics. And so the Chicano Chicano artists really had a lot to do with the shaping of what Day of the Dead looked like here, you know, in California and also throughout the Southwest. As people migrated to the United States, they brought this holiday with them. In reproducing Day of the Dead here in Los Angeles, Zapotecs, I think, have this responsibility because hands down, without question, it is the most important celebration for Zapotecs on both sides of the border. It's a holiday created from a clashing and a combining of cultures and people taking what's important from each and making something new, something vibrant, something beautiful, and something that has meaning for them as they are at that point. Now that it's practiced in very modern urban situations where diverse cultures have their own way of being and expressing, there's that level of syncretism. Maybe we could say modern life has also impacted how the tradition is practiced. This program was made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropy, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors through the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, the California Humanities, and the California Arts Council. Let's see which side. I, the other side might be a little bright. There were, there, it has two faces. And this paper holds up pretty well. It's the one that's made in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's much better quality. This year here at Donali Studio, we are honoring my great, great grandmother. We call her Mama Pola, who raised my mother and who was born in Guanimaro in 1856. And my mother tells me that she said she didn't want to die in this country. She wanted to leave, die in her homeland. And so she went back to Guanimaro. And my mother always lamented that she let her go because she didn't have any uh, close relatives there anymore. She was alone, basically. There's elements that will transcend and go on every altar that Ophelia does. So you always see uh, the paper flowers. The paper flower is important because there's a whole process in creating them, and it tends to be a process that includes many people. You need so many to get the wow factor that you see in the altares. That's something that she has learned from, from her mother and her grandmother. For this altar of honoring Mama Pola, my daughter Rosana and my son Javier are a great part of creating an altar. We've been working together on altars collaborating together for a good 10 years. We'd get together and just figure out, okay, what is the theme? Who are we honoring? And developing the concept. For the altar that we're working on now, we just kind of brainstormed and said, wouldn't it be great to go to Mama Lupe's hometown and just connect over there? I wanted to find something in Juanimero for Mama Pula's altar because it's, she was from there. She was born there and died there. Yes, yes, yes. 
50 centavos. ¿Total? Sí. ¿70 por uno? A mi mamá la bautizaron a, ahí en la iglesia en 1904, pero ya estaba la iglesia desde no sí. sé cuándo. Sí. Sí, es en 1800 y algo. Sí. Qué sí. bueno que visiten nuestro pueblo y ojalá que no te sorprenda. Oh, no, ese no. Fíjese, mi mamá me contaba, yo nunca había venido, pero yo sabía que era un pueblo muy bonito porque ella amaba a su pueblo y siempre nos, nos habló de él. Así es que aquí estamos. Qué bueno. Qué Hasta bonito. luego. Gracias. Que Gracias. ¿Y estos a cómo? Me gustan para poner en el altar, así pongo semillas, frijoles, pero vamos a ver qué, qué encontramos. Para el atole. Yeah. Hay pollitas, sí. Mira el metate, chiquito. Oh, yes. Oh, the altar, yes. the Mira el metate too. miniatura, ese me lo llevo para el altar que le pongo a mi mamá Pola. Día de los Muertos is a, an ancient, ancient tradition, a really profound tradition, ancient to the indigenous cultures of Mesoamerica. But it's also a tradition that was fused with the Spanish Catholic belief of honoring the ancestors or remembering the dead. It's a syncretism. It's a, it's a holiday created from a clashing and a combining of cultures and people taking what's important from each and making something new, something vibrant, something beautiful, and something that has meaning for them as they are at that point. A lot of people assume that those skeletons connect with the Aztec culture, but it's it's maybe a controversial idea. I think the connection can also be made to sort of this medieval European dance macabre, you know, the sort of dance of death when they had mostly in drawings and paintings, skeletons doing strange, wonderful, and funny and odd things that inspire commentary, social commentary. So it could be that this is began as that, and then it's of course been entirely reinterpreted to be its own thing. So once again, a great example of syncretism. Uh, it changed further, of course, when the Spaniards were kicked out and it became Mexico. And there was sort of a, maybe a reappropriation of Aztec imagery into the idea of this holiday. Now that it's practiced in very modern, you know, urban situations where diverse cultures have their own way of being and expressing, there's that level of syncretism. So maybe we could say modern life uh, has also impacted how the tradition is, is practiced. In the U.S., it really kind of sprung up from self-help graphics as a public celebration. Self-help graphics started in the garage of Sister Karen Bocalero with artists Carlos Bueno and Antonio Bañez in um, the earlier 70s. And in the garage, uh, they attract other artists. And with there, they kind of gain momentum. And Sister Karen, because she was part of the order of the Sisters of St. Francis of Penance and Christian Charity, receives a grant which allows them to move into their first actual building uh, on Brooklyn Avenue, uh, where they then move from a kind of informal group to a much more formalized group where they incorporate uh, self-help graphics and art. So Sister Karen was familiar with Dia de los Muertos from her time at Immaculate Heart College where in Sister Corita Kent's classroom, she would have seen a very well-known film by Charles and Ray Eames, which was titled Dia de los Muertos, from 1957. Anybody who came would sit there and watch the film, and she wanted them to get the feel of the community based altar making or celebration of Dia de los Muertos. So this film ended up becoming what Sister Karen and some of the other artists would use to share about Dia de los Muertos to a Chicano community that had never experienced that. They didn't know what that was. Um, it just wasn't part of our, our life here. Well, in the Eames film, I saw the, 
the people were making uh, these wreaths, these coronas with flowers for their altars. And so it reminded me of my mother's that she would make for our altars, so for funerals. And so I incorporated that idea, making them with tissue paper flowers. And I put foil or tin leaves, gives it a lot of uh, light and attention. <laughs> I learned lots of ways to decorate and make decorations, mostly out of paper and aluminum. Carlos Bueno and Antonio Ibanez, two um, artists from Mexico, really had a great impact also on bringing Days of the Dead tradition to self-help graphics, working with Sister Karen. Uh, and all of the artists at that early time in the early 70s, around 1972, were really um, very open and excited you know, to, to understand this tradition better and more. Of course, at that time, there was not a whole lot of information about Dia de los Muertos. Carlos and Antonio basically bring Mexican cultural practices and their knowledge of Mexican cultural practices and aesthetics to East LA. A lot of their early works are depictions of young boys, young girls wearing traditional outfits with piñatas, women with flowers in their hair. All of these nostalgic moments with Carlos and Antonio where they're calling up all of this imagery and they're putting it in their work. So you had images like the 1973 Boda de Oro print, which we think might have been one of the first commemorative prints for Day of the Dead, where you see him reaching back into his own knowledge and memories about being younger in Mexico, but then also tapping into an actual aesthetic that he saw in print. We can also assume that he would have been familiar with the work of Jose Posada as well. Like when you look at them, they don't look like Posadas necessarily. One of the figures has flowers in her eyes. They somewhat look like their faces are painted even. It, it doesn't seem to follow this sort of straight uh, white skull um, kind of motif that, or the aesthetic that Posada was working in. They held anti-war rallies in Chicago, San Francisco, Austin, and Houston. And it was a time in, especially in East Los Angeles, in different Chicano and Chicano communities of great political turmoil. In Los Angeles, we had just gone through the Chicano moratorium and the death of Ruben Salazar. And so whether consciously we realized it or not, I believe that um, the Dia de los Muertos came at a very important time and was, was embraced at a very important time in a community that felt somewhat fragmented and most definitely marginalized. So when Dia de los Muertos began to be celebrated, it came at a time in our community where we really needed something that was very healing and unifying. They were using their knowledge to respond to very definite social and cultural needs. So there was the need to be present, to be Mexican, to be Chicano in public. There was also the need to teach Chicano people about Mexican cultural history. And their approach was one about creating support, about creating community, about creating infrastructure in order to support other artists. I do want to uh, highlight Carlos as being very, and Antonio also as being very important carriers of uh, Mexican cultural practices and identity, which they then bring to self-help and then share. And then that interaction with Sister Karen, with the other artists who were there, forms Dia de los Muertos, ultimately. The very first Dia de los Muertos uh, was actually in 1972, a very small, sort of humble uh, gathering in the parking lot behind self-help graphics. But then over the years, they continued it, and it grew and grew and grew, and the community embraced it. They had processions from the nearby Evergreen Cemetery to self-help graphics, the site on then Brooklyn Avenue and Gage Streets. Early on, there was a Catholic mass that was often celebrated by Father Juan Romero, a very progressive Catholic priest. There was the participation of, of uh, Danza Azteca and some of the indigenous ceremonies and rituals as well. You had a Teatro Campesino in the late 70s joining iconic artists like Los Four and um, Asco, who were participants in the very early years. I joined them uh, around 1979. I saw a sign up, up outside their window as I would pass by. And so I went in there and I, and I met Sister Karen and she asked me 
do you know something about the other mortal or day of the dead? And I said, oh yes, my, I learned it from my mother. We practice it. And she said, okay, you come by Saturday and you'll be, uh, you can work on the workshops. There's lots of work for you to do. She's so closely tied to our Day of the Dead tradition and something that we now celebrate every year, Noche de Ofrenda, which is sort of a, a more reflective, more somber evening that we host. That was her brainchild, her and one of the former directors, Tomas Benitez. And so that is an element that is absolutely Ofelia's contribution. And I think it's important that we know that she's the person who really brought that to self-help graphics. I believe you would create a sacred space when you do an altar, no matter how humble and how simple it is. The intent is to celebrate and honor our loved ones, and so it becomes a space that is very special, calling for their spirit to join us. The altar connects the spiritual world with the physical world, essential to the de los muertos, to the celebration of it. The four elements of water, of fire, wind, and earth. All these are symbolic in the things that are there. We always put an, an arch. They call it a ventana or a window to call that loved one, their spirit, back home. Like, here's your ofrenda. This is how you get here. Uh, flowers, preferably, uh, Marigolds, because the marigolds have this very special scent, a strong scent, and that is one of the elements that beckon the spirit to come and to see their ofrenda. And so that aroma carries on to the afterlife. Candles to light the way for the dead. Petals of the marigolds strewn on the floor as a pathway guiding the spirits to the altar. My mother would say, you always have to have a glass of water because they've come from such a low way. They're gonna be thirsty. Another element you'd have is copal incense, which is also wind, um, but it's something that was used by the Aztecs. So it's another way to connect with that culture. And then I would say another key element is the storytelling that happens at the altar, that we continue to tell stories about who we're remembering so that how they lived their lives is not forgotten. It's meaningful to have those items on the ofrenda because that's what we are sharing, you know, with our, with our loved ones and our ancestors, the things that they loved in life. But having said that, I think it's also really important to make room for newer expressions and innovations in terms of the ofrenda. The tradition is rooted in art making. As more creative minds approach the tradition and create altares, they're gonna look differently. But I think the key elements need to remain as part of it. It doesn't have to look like a traditional altar, but to have elements that call the viewer that this is honoring someone and that there's a reverence of the dead. And I think our community here in Los Angeles are doing that. And so that's the example you set for the people outside of our culture. As people migrated to the United States, they brought this holiday with them. Dia de los Muertos encompasses so many aspects of our life. There is the agricultural part, which is a celebration of the harvest. In that regard, the milpa and everything that it produces, the corn, the tomatoes, the squash, the chiles, the beans, uh, those are the ultimate trophy, which the living now have a responsibility to show on the altar, to show their ancestors, their loved ones who have passed that they actually learned something from them. So in this place that we call Oaxaca, California, there is a 
pretty impressive community of uh, people from Oaxaca who speak indigenous languages. And we live all over Los Angeles in every single neighborhood. And certain times of the year, there are certain traditions that we replicate here in Los Angeles. So in reproducing Day of the Dead, Zapotecs have this responsibility to do it respectfully and, and as close as possible to the ways in which we celebrate this back at home in Oaxaca. So it could become a reference, and hopefully it would, for other people or for outsiders who may not know that this is what makes Day of the Dead so special. y lo primordial que no puede faltar es el chocolate, la taza de chocolate y su pan muerto. Es la única temporada que hacen ese pan de muerto. No lo compramos de una panadería, porque en una panadería no va a haber ese pan. Tuve que llamar a, a una, un familiar que es la que nos hace el pan en casa. Esta señora nos hace el favor de hacernos el pan. So the bread has to be very, very high quality, very special bread. It's basically a you know, family that this is what they dedicate their life to, perhaps, you know, perfecting the, the recipe for Dia de los Muertos bread. Some people might say this bread symbolizes the body of those who have passed. But you see that the bread has a little cornstarch figure which has a halo, so it's like a saint. It's like a spirit. So it can also symbolize the saints that are caring or that are helping in the travels or in the transport of the spirits. El Día de Muertos para mí, más que una fiesta, es un, un compromiso que de nosotros estamos literalmente obligados a hacerlo, porque es una tradición que seguimos desde nuestros ancestros. O sea, esa es una preparación que se hace con un mes de anticipación, por lo menos. Porque tenemos que tener todas las, las cosas. En el altar no deben faltar los cacahuates, no deben faltar las nueces, manzanas, plátanos, porque todo eso se tiene que poner en el altar. Obviamente la flor de Zamposuche, la flor de la cresta de gallo. Son las cosas que, que tienen que haber en el altar. This is like a absolute necessary flower that will go on the altar, but but that has this added um, meaning. Marigolds have a natural insecticide. What people tended to do was put in marigolds within the milpa, and so the marigolds protect the beans, corn, the chiles, the squash, the tomatoes that grow in, within the milpa. The marigolds become very important to protect the harvest, but then you get to cut them, and they are beautiful and are so vibrant. So in Oaxaca, when we're in our pueblo, the fruits come from all of the different regions around us. So these fruits and vegetables basically show that we've continued some of the connections with our neighbors from other regions. Those are also important to show on the altar because they show a continuation of a unity. That's one way to see the presence of the fruits that are brought from distant places and placed on the altar. Pasamos las fronteras, cruzamos las fronteras y estamos aquí en Estados Unidos y seguimos con nuestras tradiciones. It is a time to remember our loved ones uh, as a moment of reflection, a continuation of life in a different place, in a place without windows or doors, the underworld, which is where our deceased ancestors go. Uh, it's, it's a place where people go to live a different kind of life.
Oke. Okay. <laughs> And as long as the living members of their family remember to place an ofrenda, as long as we remember to commemorate their life, they will continue living in our memory. The recognition of the places was like a going home in a way. <laughs> Finally, to be in Guanimaro has been an experience that will stay with me forever. If I'm doing this altar for Mama Pola, I had to just try and find more information because all my life I've been wanting to do that and I didn't do enough of it to look for her. Como le dije, este, en el registro civil, ahí sí encuentra el acta de nacimiento, pues este, de matrimonio, y aquí ya sería pues todo lo religioso que son los sí. Ok, gracias. Buenas tardes. Buenos días todavía, ¿verdad? Pues estoy en busca de acta de nacimiento o algún documento sobre mi bisabuela. Yo sé que murió aquí en Guanímaro a mi Sí. Eso sí podemos buscar, por ejemplo, la, la, el acta de defunción. Ajá. O sé que fue en 1938. Eh, ¿Su defunción? Su defunción de mi tatarabuela. Este, permítame, eh, ¿el mes no lo tiene? Ay, no, no sé. Pero es 38, Sí, segura. 38, sí. Okay. Entonces, permítame un poquito, okay. vamos a traerlo okay. y sobre eso. Ah, bajo la fecha o el Tinoco. ¿Qué es? Es 1937. Ok, yo estaba incorrecta. Tinoco y Purita. Es el acta número 68 en Guanímaro, Guanajuato, a las 13 horas del día 6 de junio de 1937, compareció Manuel Rodríguez, que a las 23 horas del día de ayer, que fue del día 5 de junio, falleció de anemia cerebral la señora Hipólita Tino. Natividad Perez. She opened her home to us and we stayed there several days and we just talked a lot. You know, it's just a lot of talking and storytelling and the family tree and who is who. You know, I used to help my mother make all kinds of flowers. This was basic, but just uh, remember she would make those big um, flowers for the weddings. because she took, she would say they made all kinds of decorations. Oh, but, but just uh, this style of flowers, then I just started teaching students and then for self help graphics, we, we were doing all those all those workshops and all of you kids, even Even the boys, JP, and oh, your dad, he made a lot of these flowers. 
lots of stories told during the flower making. Oh, how pretty. Oh, that's beautiful. So part of the process of creating this altar was looking for her in the cemetery. Mama Pola died in 1937. That cemetery has probably been overcrowded for the last 60, 70 years. So her marker is not there. Apenas uh, conseguí su acta de difunción y la enterraron aquí. Sé que antes no hacían tumbas así, era tierra. Ajá. Sí. Era tierra nada más. ¿Y cuál de estos son abandonados? Mm, hay algunas. Mm, mire, aquí está una. Mm, aquí de la, de la cantera es de las más antiguas. ¿Nos pueden llevar a sí. sí. Ahora Margarito ayudó a enterrar a mi abuela, la que busco. Me dijo él que él fue uno de los que estaba muchacho y ayudó a enterrarla. Oh. Aquí está Margarito Don Robledo, oh. en esta tumba. Gracias a Margarito porque él ayudó a enterrar a mi mamá Pola, que estaba sola cuando murió. Part of the reason that self-help graphics exist as a space is that there weren't spaces showing Chicano Latino art in the 70s. They didn't value that work and they didn't understand it. And so self-help became this sort of de facto space of production, but also of exhibition. One of the things that Sister Karen wanted uh, was to support artists. And so they started having uh, the printmaking related to Day of the Dead, and then the prints being uh, exchanged or sh exhibited outside of Los Angeles. And incorporating the images for Dia de Muertos became also part of this expansion and this popularity. I think there's something really beautiful about the way each artist interprets the celebration and how they choose to uh, have that manifest through a print. Some of the pieces that come to mind and that show the diversity are uh, John Valadez, who did a print. Uh, it actually has an image of Jesus and um, the image of a, a gentleman that he had picked up or copied from a Mexican crime magazine. And that was in the early earlier years in the 70s. And so again, you have this um, sort of imagery coming together and this understanding of what Dia de los Muertos is also coming together, including some of the Catholic iconography, um, but also um, very representative of that time, especially for that artist. Fast forward a little bit down the line and you have Gronk's piece, the 10th anniversary Dia de los Muertos print. It's a, a portrait of this character, La Tormenta, and he's talked about her earrings and how he made them 
little uh, like skeleton earrings and uh, the shape of them and how he wasn't trying to create something sort of scary, but rather playful. And again, very reflective of, of this particular artist, um, uh, but not this extremely traditional uh, aesthetic for Day of the Dead. Fast forward 2012, we have Patsy Valdez and her print, Dee Dee starring in the SHG revival print. And that was actually um, a true commemoration for a friend of hers who had passed. And so it's the artist's portrait. And in a way, you almost have like a, a combination of an ofrenda with the print. The prints have really varied over the years aesthetically, in terms of content and theme, portraiture to really graphic pieces. And again, all reflective of the way that Dia de los Muertos at Self-Help is very much a sort of Chicano celebration. I grew up here in Boyle Heights with my dad, uh, and my dad was a single parent, and he did not really have any interest in religion at all, and he just encouraged me to acquire knowledge and read books and, and think about things for myself. Most of my family, I think, they weren't too concerned about history and about where we come from. Their concern was more about how we survive now. I didn't have any connection uh, to Day of the Dead um, until I came to Self Help Graphics. So this is the first yellow that went down. And then this was the magenta that went over it. So just thinking about how you build layers and how you build a fire. And this was another magenta and red that went over it. And then this was a blue and then a red using the same screen. And this was a white to go over the stripe to cover up some of my mess ups. This year I've had the honor uh, to be asked to make the commemorative print for South Hub Graphics. There is a lineage of print here for Dia de los Muertos, and there's a lineage of printmakers and artists. I think it's kind of a big deal for me, especially since I've been volunteering and working here for a long time. For Dewey's print, you're looking at a statement around the resilience of our, of our community, of our ancestors, and seeing it actually, I think, through a remix sort of pop icon that is the Nike Cortez. The image itself is definitely a syncretic product, bringing forward the Cortez as a sneaker, reimagining it as a protective shield, and also I think helping people immediately go into a geographic place. When you see the way that they're hung, you know exactly what that is, what it's hanging from, and you can almost put yourself in your own memory of where you would have seen sneakers hanging from a power line. And I think for me, thinking about the shoe and, and who wears them and what they mean, and even the name of it, Cortez, and, and how can we change that up? How can we decolonize that, the image of these hanging shoes? The connection of my image with the Dilas Mortis holidays is all about resilience and memory and kind of how we remember the past and, and how we take those memories with us into the future, um, into our survival, and, and kind of what we learn historically, what we learn ancestrally, and taking that knowledge and just advancing ourselves. Cortez was the conquistador, and Cotemoc is one of the last emperors of the Nochtetlan who actually interacted with Cortez, and Cortez enslaved him and captured him and burned his feet 
to try to get him to tell him where the gold was at. So the story of Cuauhtémoc and Cortez is kind of the story of resistance. Our trip to Wanimaro was really impacting because I found that when I went there, I was home. And my experience here in East LA was home also. And that's because of my grandmother. My mom always says, se vino pero se trajo su tierra. And when I went to Wanimaro, I recognized that. I see my, my children as carrying on this tradition after I can no longer do this. They have been helping me first when they were younger, making flowers. In fact, I engaged my grandchildren to make flowers, but through the years, they contribute to the composition, to the foundation. My son actually does most of the building and putting it together for me, and he's making an arch for this, this altar. El Arco is the focal point uh, besides the photographs. Right now we're in the process of creating this altar to Mama Pola that we, we're titling it Nahuas Sabias. Nahuas in the indigenous language is skirt, it's a skirt. Sabias means wisdom, you know, wise skirts. So wise women, that's what this ofrenda is about. We're focusing on the Purepecha culture, the women of that culture. The women, they wear the, their big trenzas, and they look like there's like 50 ribbons on each trenza. It was so beautiful. So we added them to the arch. We're actually gonna create these skirts as the, the altar, you know, the, the actual adornment around the table will have this feel of the, of the skirts. I believe it's, a, it's a an art form, maybe it's called folk art, but it's for me it's important that all the items at the end complete a whole composition. But I like to have many vignettes within the altar because they tell stories. They tell stories about the person we're honoring. This vignette here really encapsulates my cultural and spiritual sustenance, I believe, from my mother, who she was passed down from Mama Pola. Her nopal cactus there was a very important sustenance, nutritional substance that I received as a child that my mother always talked about. Her Mama Pola would cook for her in so many different ways. And then, of course, Our, our Lady of Guadalupe, they were devotees of, of, of the Virgen. She was the mera mera, I guess you would say, like the main woman. And then I, in the background, there's that, uh, that wreath, that corona that I learned from her. Everything I learned from my mother, she learned from Mama Pola. Here, it's a composite of Mama Pola and my mother, of their lifestyle and what they represented for me. I would say that mujeres de maíz, because the food they prepared basically was corn, nisamal, tortillas, and all these traditional foods that they were great uh, artists with. And so el metate, el molcajete, todo representa la cocina, la comida, el amor de la sustancia que nos crió. Dia de los Muertos is not about replicating what happens in Mexico. Uh, I think it's always been its own Chicano invention here on the east side, paying homage to the traditional ways 
uh, but speaking to the issues that are experienced by the community here. We are racially mixed. That is our inherent nature. And so being enriched by diverse uh, spiritual practices is very natural for us. There's no um, conflict there at all. And so the artists really had a lot to do with the shaping of what Day of the Dead looked like here, you know, in California and also throughout the Southwest. If you see many of the ways it's celebrated, at least in a public manner, in the Chicano Chicano communities, you see, for example, the Danza Azteca, the Aztec dancers. And that, I believe, has its origins in the fact that in the early 70s, there were several maestros. They came from Mexico with the intention of really teaching the people in the Chicano Chicano community aspects of danza ceremony ritual. That was a connection, a direct connection to some of the rituals and celebrations, again, that we had been disconnected from. Here in Los Angeles, it's a big celebration, I guess, American style in a way, but it still is the, in our community, the Chicano or Latino community. It still has that Mexicanness, that cultural aspect of it, but it's just like on a wider scale. Grown in a way where it's kind of not just that religious celebration anymore or the indigenous celebration, it's more of like a bigger celebration that's kind of like a party. Today we're gonna be creating this Dia de los Muertos inspired look. There you go, 99 cent store. So it's like face tattoos. We could go to Target and we could buy a sugar skull and we could build altar from items that we could buy at Michael's. That does look like the one at Disneyland. Oh yeah, you can't trademark Day of the Dead. It, it's weird. Pop culturally, people picked it up. So there's films about it, The Book of Life or Coco. It's been Disneyfied. Obviously, there's something really beautiful about being able to share part of your culture with the rest of the world and having it be appreciated. The other side of that is when that element of culture is being appropriated and used as a marketing tool to sell beer or lotto tickets. Dia de los Muertos. At what point is it too much and is it too far? Uh, when it's not actually benefiting the community, it's just for corporate interests. That's something that I don't think is within our control. By living in Los Angeles, we are outside of our pueblos, we are outside of Oaxaca, and so transformations will naturally occur. And I think that one of the most visible changes that I've seen in recent years is the makeup on the face, for example. That's not something that we do in our communities, but I've seen young Zapotecs painting their faces and participating in more public shows of Day of the Dead celebrations which seems like a natural transformation. The face painting really was also an expression that came out of the artist community. As I remember, in my, some of my early trips to Mexico, I did not really see face painting at that time. Now, I think if you go to Mexico, it's become popular. And I think part of that is because of the internet and because some of the films, you know, that people have been exposed to. But the face painting really was something that you began to see more and more in the Chicana and Chicano community. And of course, that was an inspiration of the Calavera imagery from Mexico and from Jose Guadalupe Posada and, and some of the ancient, um, you know, sculptures of life and death and duality. The young people who are making this, these transformations have family who are celebrating the way that we celebrate in our communities. So you get to have kind of both worlds. The young Zapotecs get to go outside and go to Hollywood Forever and paint their face or go to some of the more public events. Uh, but then more than likely return 
to the family and the community that celebrates in the very different way that is more private. I think that's why it's so important to understand what the essence of a, any given tradition is. And that goes not only for the people that own those traditions and, and are practicing those traditions and sharing those traditions, but there's a responsibility for other communities when they embrace or when they adapt Days of the Dead traditions. There's a responsibility that comes along with that and understanding what it means and not just exploiting the superficial aspects of Days of the Dead. It's more than, you know, it's more than painting your face like a skeleton or calavera. There's more underneath that. And so there's a responsibility that comes with that, I believe. If you're going to appropriate or if you're going to borrow or if you're going to do that, you do it uh, with, in a manner where you're respectful and try to understand the tradition. night for a long time, especially this year, honoring Hipólita Tinoco, Mama Pola, my great-great-grandmother, just getting inside her spirit, uh, learning more about her, going to her birthplace, uh, the place where she, where she died and was buried and lived, and it's been a wonderful journey, and I have much more to share now with my children and grandchildren. The stories about Mama Pola were always present. I've been passing on these stories about her to my children, and I hope that they pass them on to her, their children. And that's what this celebration is about, of keeping the memory of our loved ones alive. I think this is a, the, the moment that, the appropriate moment to ask all of you to invoke the name of someone you, <laughs> I, it's very hard in your heart that you are remembering and just say their name and all of us will say presente. Hipólita Tinoco. Presente. Guadalupe Salazar. Presente. Amado Esparza. Presente. Alberto Aviles. Presente. Usted está consciente que van a venir las almas a festejar con ustedes. Es algo que no se puede explicar. Se siente una emoción, se siente, no sé, no, no podría explicarle con palabras lo que se siente, pero es, es algo muy bonito. De hecho, el día primero, que es el día en que llegan a mediodía, tenemos que abrir la puerta de la casa y poner incienso para decirle a las almas, pasen, están en su casa, son bienvenidos.
Yo creo que la muerte va a llegar cuando uno menos se lo espera. Si estoy en Oaxaca y estoy en Tlacolula y allí me muero, ahí me quedo. Y si estoy aquí en Los Ángeles, ni modo, me voy a tener que quedar aquí. Entonces la perspectiva de, una muerte, de la muerte yo creo que a todos nos va a llegar. Y cuando eso me llegue, yo creo que toda mi familia está contenta porque yo ya viví. Igual van a tener que poner un altar para que yo venga a visitar a mi familia. This program was made possible in part by a grant from Anne Ray Foundation, a Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropy, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors through the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, the California Humanities, and the California Arts Council.